Joy in the city. Joy in your life. Joy in your family. And joy everywhere in Jesus' name. GCK Authority has announced the next level move. From the land of honor and integrity comes two in one GCK live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Professionals, titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT, all broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Praise the Lord. Great to be with you again. And I thank the Lord for those of you who made it. How many of you made it from Tuesday till this very time? And you didn't miss a single day. Wonderful people. The Lord bless every one of you in Jesus' name. And for the rest of us, the blessing of God will be abundant in your life too. It's great and wonderful to be with you again. And tonight we are going to consider some matters. Uh, some of you will think that this is heavy stuff. And, uh, but I'll try and make it simple for you and you will get through in Jesus' name. I put us, for those of you on the other campuses and you're joining, all with, joining in with us now. It's been a great time over here. I don't know how wonderful you are here, but uh, the Unilag uh, congregation is the most wonderful congregation I ever met in any university. You know, young people are, you know, sometimes uh, they, they tease and they tickle old people like me, but you are just a nice, nice congregation. And it's uh, wonderful to minister with you. God bless every one of you. We are going into the word of God now. Well, be very systematic. And today we have, if you have any thinking cap, you put the thinking cap on because we're going to do some logical things here today. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and worship you. We know you are a great God. And you are the God of heaven, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. We turn our hearts and minds to you right now. And we're praying that you'll bless us in Jesus' name. Enlighten us. Make us understand what you want to teach us today. And we pray the strength, the power, the grace to say no to evil and yes to righteousness. You give to every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. We are considering the subject submission to ultimate authority submission to ultimate authority what happens when there is no authority what happens when there is no leadership you say can it ever be like that in any society oh yes sometimes it's like that look at judges chapter 17 judges Chapter 17, verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was a time in the land of Israel when there was no leadership. And there was no king. And there was no rule of the law. And everybody just did what was right to him in Judges chapter 21 Judges chapter 21 verse 25 in those days there was no king in Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes I want you to picture and imagine that people in a particular country will not have any constitution any law any law enforcement agency, any leadership in any section, 
and everybody just ran around and did whatever they wanted to do. Imagine yourself being a citizen in such a place. When we talk about submission to ultimate authority, authority in the human society prevents lawlessness, anarchy, disorder, confusion, pandemonium, and the reign of terror and violence. If you live in a community where there is no orderliness, where there is no check, where everybody just did what he felt doing whenever, wherever he wanted to do it, here is what you're going to have. Acting without authority will mean operating by the mob law. That is, there is, there is a crowd. And that crowd, depending on the mood of the situation, depending on the emotion that is more pronounced, depending on the direction of the gangster, that wants to lead the mob, eventually the mob law will go into what is referred to as the lynch law. That is, you can lynch anyone. After all, there is nobody to challenge you. And there is nobody to say, why are you doing what you are doing? What's the final result? We are going to have another Babel. When there is so much confusion, and nobody knows the direction to go. In Second Chronicles chapter 15, Second Chronicles chapter 15, looking at verses 3, 5, and 6. Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse 3. Now, for a long time, Israel had been without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without law. Think about that to start with. A whole nation without law. Talk about wanting liberty. Talk about wanting to do what I want to do whenever I want to do it. Now, it's not only in our community of young people that we have had some of that campaign. The campaign of unrestrained freedom. The campaign of unlimited liberty. Why is it some of us that have read some history and we have known of the past civilization and we know of the collapse of the past civilization, what happened to them? And then we come with that background that if we follow through on this campaign of unrestrained freedom, unlimited liberty, it will only ignite the fire of self-destruction. We'll destroy ourselves. Because say, it says, for a long time, a long season, Israel had been without the true God, and without a teaching priest, and without the law. What was the result? Look at verse 5. It says, and in those days, there was no peace to him that went out, not to him that came in, but great vexations, trouble, trauma, confusion, trouble, were, in all, were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. A nation was destroyed of nation. Destruction will come. That means then, as we are talking about ultimate authority tonight, the principle of orderliness, you see, in all creation. When you reverse or disrupt that orderliness, it will bring chaos. Authority simply signifies the right to make laws that must be obeyed. That's, that's as simple as that. That's authority. Somebody has the right to make laws. And then those laws must be obeyed. Submission to benevolent authority makes us responsible and preserves our legitimate rights. As we talk about authority, I'm going to start at the very top and then I'll come down a bit. 
I start from the very top, divine authority. And then I will come down to delegated authority. And then I will come to where we are now, disregarding authority. Number one, the concept of divine authority. When I talk about divine, I'm talking about God. I'm talking about the creator. And here, he has created us. And because he made us, and he made the world, he had some picture in his mind, some ideas in his mind, before he made the world, and before he made us. And because of that, he has given us some things to regulate our lives, so that we will move towards the pattern, the plan, the picture, that he painted in his mind, before he made us. To start with, let us establish the fact that God is king, that God is ruler, that God is governor. In Psalm 22, reading in verse 28, Psalm 22, verse 28, For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. That tells you then, because he created us, he has not created us and then abdicated, abandoned responsibility. He has not said, now I've made you. Take care of yourself. He still takes care of us. That's why Paul the Apostle said, as one of your poets said, by him we live and move and have our being. He's still in charge. And he is still the governor. That's why it says here, he is the governor among the nations. In Psalm 103, Psalm 103, it tells us in verse 19, that he has prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. He is king, he is president, if you please is the one on top. Here is the concept of divine authority. In fact, because he has that divine authority, the Bible refers to him as the lawgiver. That means the one who gives us the constitution by which we ought to live among ourselves. That's what we're talking about. When you talk about authority, you talk about constitution, you talk about institution. You talk about the assembly and society of people. And this society of people, they are led and guided by the constitution. Every country has constitution. And the whole world at large has constitution that comes from the governor of the whole universe. In Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33, in verse uh, 22, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Do you see the different titles that is used, that are used in referring to God, he is king. He is governor, he is lawgiver. Now let's think together a bit. The physical law guarantees the order of sequence in the physical world. Now, if we put this table here, and we put this table here since Tuesday, when we came on Wednesday, it was predictable. We knew we will meet this table here. All these chairs were lined up here. We knew they would be there. Why? Because there's a physical law. If there were no physical law, there will be confusion. I put something somewhere. I'm not sure I'll meet that thing there when I come back. Or now, I'll be going home when, when I leave this place. If there is no physical law, I will not be sure that the house will still be there by the time I get there. Think of how you will feel if you cannot predict your community. You cannot predict society. 
you cannot predict that what you put there will remain there. Even that simple physical law. You see, when the physical law is there, it helps you. It makes your life happy. And you rest and you relax because of the operation of the physical law. Now, the moral law is a rule of moral action with sanction. The moral law is a rule of moral action with sanction. Let me explain to you. If the law is there, but no sanction, that is, if you broke the law, nothing will happen, nobody will keep the law. That's why every time there is a law made by God, there is a sanction, there is a consequence for the people that break that law. The moral law is the rule to which moral agents ought to conform. All their voluntary actions. And it's enforced by sanctions equal to the value of that precept. That is, you make a law and then you attach a sanction with it. And the sanction you are at, apply to it, attach to it, is equal to the value of that precept. And God, the creator, the king and the governor of the moral government, has, because of his power, character, relation to the universe, and because of his wisdom and love, because of our relationship to him, we are responsible to him. He made us. That's the reason he, as the lawgiver, he is right. And he has the right, which is supreme, unchallenged authority. Now, if you're going to have a moral law, there should be some characteristics of that moral law. Because, you see, somebody cannot just rise up and say, I make a law, and the law is this. We're going to test that law. And the law that God has, there are some characteristics of that law. We're talking about the concept of the divine authority. What are the characteristics? I give, there are many, but I give you just seven. Number one, objectivity. Number two, universality. Number three, imparti impartiality. Number four, practicability. Number five, immutability. Number six, unity. Number seven, responsibility. Let me go through one by one. Number one, you have objectivity. When we say something is objective, not subjective, it's objective. It means the laws that God has made. It's not for his own selfish purpose. You know, just God there as a king, as a governor up there, he just woke up one morning and said, I just want to make a law. No, he thought about us. The objective is for our good, for our happiness, for our coexistence. And as you come to this campus, all that we are saying, say no to evil. Say yes to righteousness. It's objective. All we're saying is, this is for our good. This is for our happiness. And this is for us to be able to coexist together without destroying ourselves. Number two, universality. The same requirement demanded for man anywhere man is found. The laws of God, you have universality. That is, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, 2,000 years ago, the same laws that God has given for our good, for our happiness, for our coexistence together, those laws are still significant and important and necessary and indispensable today because of the universality of the laws of God. What's the law of God? You will not steal. That's universal. And whether you are in a village or in a university, whether you are in America or you are in China, whether you are in Nigeria or you are in France, anywhere you are, you will not steal. It's a universal law. The universality 
of the law of God. Number three, the impartiality of the law of God. The moral law is no respecter of persons. And the moral law knows no privileged class. That is here we are. We are civilized. We are refined. And we are educated. And we are sophisticated. Because of that, we are now above the law. Did you hear what they say? They say, nobody is... Ah, you knew that. Nobody is above the law. That means then, there is no privileged class of people that will say, uh -uh, I am now educated, therefore I am above the law. You have the impartiality of the moral law. Number four, the practicability of the moral law. That which demands a natural impossibility is not a moral law. That which demands something that cannot be done is not a moral law. Let me give you an example. You know that we human beings, we are supposed to walk and run. We use our legs. Suppose now somebody were to command me and he said, fly. I said, but I cannot. He said, if you don't, I'll punish you. You see, that's an impossibility because the Lord has not created us with the nature to fly. We're not birds. Therefore, the moral law does not demand something impossible. All that the law demands, there are things that are possible. There are things you can do. There are things I can do. When it says that I must not kill you, I can restrain myself and not kill you. When it says I should not take another person's life, when it says, I shall not tell lies against you, I can do that. I can restrain myself. I can put myself in your shoes. If you told lies against me, how would I feel? And because I would not want you to do that to me, therefore I would not do it to you. It's, it's practicable. It's workable. I can practice it. The practicability of the moral law. What the moral law demands must be possible for each of us to obey. Number five, the immutability of the law. The moral law can never change. Never. Can never change. You know, it says um, this will pass away. This will pass away. This will pass away. But charity, love will never pass away. When we get to heaven, there will be love in heaven. Because Jesus said, Father, you have loved me. And I love you. I'm telling my disciples this, that they may know that the love wherewith you have loved me, I love them in the same way. Which means there is love in heaven. When we get to heaven, and you get to heaven, because that's where we're taking you. You will not tell lies against me in heaven. In heaven, you will not be allowed to tell lies. In heaven, you will not steal. You will have your mansion, I will have my mansion. In heaven, you will not kill me. And I will not kill you. The laws are immutable. Immutable, unchangeable. The law of love in the human society. That anywhere we go, even among the angels, hatred is not permitted among the angels. Murder is not permitted among the angels. The law of God is immutable, unchangeable. That means then the characteristic and the property of the moral law. Number five, it is immutable. The requirement is as immutable as God himself. Number six, unity. Do you see the moral law? The moral law proposes one ultimate goal and one ultimate pursuit. When somebody came to Jesus and was saying, all these laws, number one, number two, number three, and there is number four, and it's not finished yet, and number five, and number six, and number seven, number eight, number nine, number ten, can you just tell me, the one single law I can hold on to, and then I'll know I'm all right. And Jesus said, 
you will love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then you love your neighbor as yourself. Because love is the royal law, is the final law, is the ultimate law, is the summary of all the laws. The moral law has unity in it. Everything is centered on love. And because of that, whoever you are, whatever campus you belong to, and whatever organization you belong to, whatever church denomination you belong to, here is the unity of the moral law that says the whole thing, the summary of the whole thing is love. Number seven is the responsibility. Responsibility. The moral law calls us to be responsible people. The moral law makes us to make or allows us and encourages us to make the choice of what is right. The moral law. All that the moral law is saying is that you will make the right choice. And you know, the way the Lord has made us, he has not programmed us like robots. That he will just program you and make you to do what you don't want to do. Look up here. Uh, for example, here is uh, this bottle of uh, water. Those of you far at the back, you will not see. But you know, you understand bottle. Therefore, even if you don't see, there's a bottle of water here. And then I put the bottle of water there. And then I go there, I go there, I go there. When I come back, I still find the bottle of water there. And then I say, bottle of water, thank you for staying here. Do I do that? No, because the bottle of water did not have any volition, any will to stay or not to stay. Because it's there and the physical law keeps it there, there is no thank you. But if I left you here and I said, please wait for me. And I went there and went there and went there. And I came back and I met you there. And you are still there. I'll say, oh, thank you. You waited for me. Why did I say thank you to him? And I didn't say thank you to the bottle. Because the bottle had no choice. It will be there. And it was there. And it will always be there. Except you come and steal it. <laughs> so, because it has no will of its own, because it has no voluntary action that it will take. That's why we don't say thank you. The same thing, this microphone here and all the other gadgets that are there, when we finish, we don't say, we've been working since Tuesday. If we're going to thank anybody, it's the people that are operating the microphone with, with thank. Is that not so? Do we thank the microphone itself? Uh-uh. There's no reward for the microphone itself because it has no choice responsibility. God makes us free moral agents so that you will apply your will. And when you apply your will and you do what is right, they will say thank you. Then we reward you. It is the freedom. It is the volition. It is the will that you exert, that you do the right thing that makes us to say you are a responsible boy. You are a responsible girl. It is that responsibility that attracts reward to you. That's the reason we have God as the ultimate authority. The divine authority. That's the concept. Point number, point number one. The concept of divine authority. Now I come to point number two. The constitution of delegated authority. The constitution of delegated authority. Now, you've heard the language constituted authority. That means some people, they came together, and these people, they became the authority. Now, what has happened here? What has happened is this. God delegated his authority to human authorities and institutions. God delegated his own authority to human authorities and institutions. If you look at uh, Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, reading from verse 1, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. 
For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, the authority, the constituted authority, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that shall, and they shall receive, they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Do you see here, when we come into our campus, there is constituted authority on the campus. And this constituted authority is delegated to them by God. It says, for the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. That is, the reason we have constituted authority is to restrain evil and to promote good. Have that in your mind. The authorities are not our enemies. Constituted authorities, they are not there to scare us, to make life difficult for us. Constituted authorities, there to restrain evil. Why are they restraining evil? To make life easy for you. To make life secured for you. Why do they have to restrain evil? So that you'll be able to study, you'll be able to do what you need to do with peace of mind. And then they promote something good. And they promote our peace. They promote our protection. It says in verse 3, For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Without then, not be afraid of the power. Will you not be afraid? Why would you say, I don't care, of course you ought to care. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is, a, is the minister of God to thee for good. Look at this. And it's not talking about church. It's talking about constituted authority in a secular world. It's talking about constituted authority in normal society. And it says that these, uh, these people are the ministers of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, repeating the second time, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must need be subject, not only to, for the wrath, for wrath, but also for conscience sake. It brings in your conscience now. It says, you say you belong to God. Don't you know then that God has delegated authority? And for your own conscience sake, you will act right to the delegated authorities. What God has done is this. God has made sure that everybody on earth is under authority. Let me show you this. In um, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, reading verse 9. For I am a man under authority. Having soldiers under me. Before I go on, look up here. Look at this man. He said, I am a man under authority. Above me, there is authority. I am a man under authority. Having soldiers under me. Look at that. Hey, look at our daddy. Our daddy, I mean your daddy at home. He has authority over you. When he goes to the place of work, there is a boss over him. He's a man under authority, having children under him. Look at mom. Mom in the house is a woman under the authority of the father, having children under her. And look at our lecturers. The lecturer is a man under the authority of the institution, and having young people, students under. And look at the president of our country. He's a man under the authority of the constitution of the nation. And then he has subjects under him. Everybody is under authority. And he also has people under his authority. That's the way the Lord has made the world. That nobody will live in isolation. Nobody will say, I have absolute authority that will result into tyranny. But he has authority above him. But you also, you have him above you as the authority. 
as we look at what God has done, that the Lord himself has put everyone under authority, even though you have those under you. Who has the Lord delegated authority to? Number one, parents. God has delegated authority to parents. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through to three children will be your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. The parents, they are also, they, they have delegated authority. Number two, leaders. Leaders also have authority because God has delegated his authority to them. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. It tells us here, Remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken <clears throat> to you. The word of God, whose faith follow. Considering the end of their conversation, verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Do you see here, number one, parents, they have authority delegated to them by God. Number two, leaders have authority delegated to them by God. Number three now, the rulers, the rulers. When you think of the rulers, you think of a local government, if you think about the nation, you think about a state. Then you think about the federal government. And as you come to our institution, you, you think about your faculty. From your faculty, you also have departments within that faculty. And then you think of you know, the whole campus, you think of the whole university, you think of the Senate. And as you think about everything, you have authority delegated unto them. In Romans chapter 13, <clears throat> verse 3. For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Then we have kings and governors. Remember, all these categories of leaders and rulers, God has delegated authority to them. In First Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse uh, 13 and verse 14. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or to governors as to them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of them that do well. You have governors, you have Kings, and then you also have authorities in general. Authorities. In First Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. For kings and for all that are in authority. All that are in authority. So then we understand that we have delegated authority. And the constitution of delegated authority is to share in the responsibility of God. That's why God delegated. And those delegated authorities, that is those authorities to whom power and some rights and some responsibilities have been delegated to, they're representing God. And their laws are not opposed to the law of God. It may be expressed in another way. For example, when you get to a factory and you are working there, there is delegated authority there. When you come to uh, a department here in the faculty, you also have authority there. And the authority in the department, they want us to do some things, and therefore they put it in a particular language. The language they use will be different from the language you use in the factory for the uh, people on the production line because of their level of understanding and because of the work they are doing. But when you put everything together and you analyze everything, all they are asking for in the department here, be honest, be trustworthy, be dependable, 
be predictable. Be a good example in this department. If everybody were to act like your act, what kind of department are we going to have? That's all they are saying. Whatever grammar they use and whatever technical terms they use when you analyze everything, that's what it boils down to. You come to the factory and all they are telling them there, when you analyze everything, be honest, be trustworthy, be dependable. If everybody in this factory works the way you work, what kind of factory are we going to have is the same thing. You may use different languages. Therefore, wherever you are, you look at the laws, you look at the do's and don'ts, you look at the regulations there, and then you say, here am I, I'm going to fit in into this community, and I'm going to do something that is right, so that the delegated authority here will appreciate I'm a member of this community. What are we to do? To this delegated authority, we're to honor them, two, we're to obey them, Three, we're to submit to them. Four, we're not to resist them. Five, we're to bear the punishment of our wrongdoing patiently. That doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Sometimes, you know, as a Christian, you mistakenly forgot to have put your number on your paper. Or you did your exam and you are penalized for it. And you know it's your fault. You're a Christian, but you did something you shouldn't have done. Now that paper is like you didn't do the exam and you put a zero there. Don't fight. Don't try to petition. It's my fault. I am wrong. I bear the punishment of my error patiently. So, this is what we're to do. As you relate on the campus, and you submit yourself the way God expects, and the Lord will bless you. I come to the final point, which is the consequence of disregarding authority. The consequence of disregarding authority. When we disregard authority, what happens? We look at this in Jude, Jude verses 7 and 8. In Jude verses 7 and 8, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and give and going after strange flesh, set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now you see here, we have the example of Sodom and Gomorrah, where the rule of law are totally broken down. And it says, look at the consequence on them. They suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. Then it says in verse 8, likewise, in the same way, also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and they speak evil of dignities. You see, it's when young people do evil, they do bad things, and they don't want any control, any restraint, any check. Then they result into a kind of a bad language, or truancy, or what are you going to do? It is our time. We are the young people. And this, it is our time syndrome has really made law and order to collapse. And it is bringing a culture of destruction. It is our time. Yes, it's our time. Our time to do what? Our time to prepare for the future. Our time to use our strength and energy in a positive way. Our time to show that young people too can be righteous. And young people too can contribute positively to the nation. It's our time where we'll let our light so shine on this campus. My young brothers and sisters, you are here for this period of time. What legacy are you going to leave behind? Are you going to leave a legacy of when that student was here? Huh? They almost burnt this whole department down. And every time we see you, after you're finished on the campus here, and we see you outside, we say, where are you now? 
Oh, you say, well, I'm just uh, here and there. What are you doing now? I've not been able to get a job. And the lecturer, he will not talk, but he'll say, hmm, what we so worried. Look at this young man. He almost broke our heads, and we lecturers feared him. And we almost pushed him away from the department. Now no place wants to take him to work. How this seem boomerangs? And what we throw at the department is waiting for us. When we get back to life, it is thrown back at us. I pray God will forgive us. Amen. And God will change what is bad and things will become good. That's why we came here over this week to learn how to say no to evil. And how to say yes to righteousness. And this period of time has done something in our lives. We're going to do well. Yeah. We're going to act right. Yeah. And we're going to say no to evil. We're going to say yes to righteousness. Now, if we keep on disregarding constituted authority, what's the result? Number one, punishment. Number two, poverty. Number three, possible suffering, painful suffering. Because you will see, at the end of time, there is something that is called hellfire. Now, what if we turn around today, and that's what we're doing, and we say, now by the grace of God, I say no to evil, and I say yes to righteousness. God helping me. Christ in me, the hope of glory. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I make up my mind. And you make up your mind. And we as a team together, we say no together to evil. And we say yes to righteousness. What's going to be the result? Peace and security. Think about it. If our society becomes orderly, and then will be the laws that are made for our good. Number one, there will be peace and security. Number two, there will be the preservation of society. No destruction of property. No destruction of life. And there's preservation of society. Then number three, praise and significance. We don't have time for me to go through the scriptures with you. But, you know, when these people evaluate the condition of our country. And then you read in the papers. And they say we are the second most corrupt country in the whole world. Think about that. You shake your head and you say, ah. And then when you travel, if you get here and uh, to any country and you say, from which country are you? You say Nigeria. You're a Nigerian and they want to watch you very well. And if you want to transfer from any university in Nigeria, and you want to go and study in America, or study in Europe, and uh, you apply over there, and then you send your transcripts to uh, America, to that institution, once they see that the transcript is coming from a uh, university in Nigeria, uh, and they say, please, you will take tests. When you take an exam here, then we know your level. And even though you are level 300, whatever here, when you get there, they say, please, if you want to study here, start again. You say, okay. Because they feel that if we all strive for six months and uh, in a year, and they don't know when we're in school and when we're not in school, at all this thing about selling marks and selling certificates, they hear. Because of that, uh, they don't value our certificate. But if we change around, in a few years, there will be praise and in our, there will be significance. Anywhere you take your certificate to, it will be honored. Then, number four, there will be the privilege of service. You, you are having the good character, and the good culture, and obedience to constituted authority. And everything is orderly now. And we're able to make progress. And we're able to have everything we ought to have. They'll be looking for students from this university, students from this institution, because we have heard about that institution. Something has taken place there. We want the youth uh, coppers coming from that area to come and work in our company. There will be the privilege of service. That's why we're binding ourselves together in a covenant of acting right. 
And by the grace of God, we're going to act right now. Why don't you stand up and let us commit ourselves to the Lord. During this period, the Lord has taught us a lot. Now we come to the point where we say, today is not the end of the program. Today is not the end of saying no to evil and yes to righteousness. This is just the beginning. I commit my life. I commit myself to saying no to evil and yes to righteousness. You will commit yourself to the Lord in a very definite way. Very definite way. Number one, you commit yourself to the authority that is divine, supreme authority, the authority of God. God, you created me. I offer myself back to you. Lord Jesus, you died for me. You are my Savior. I offer myself back to you. With your help, I will no more despise constituted authority. I will no more disregard constituted authority. I now take constituted authority as representing you. I will respect them. I will honor them. I will obey them. I will say no to evil. Yes to righteousness. In Jesus name we pray. If you have not received Jesus as your personal savior, I want to give you the chance. The reason I'm doing that is this. It will give you strength. I know you have a good decision already. You want to say no to evil. You want to say yes to righteousness. And the one who gives you the power to do that effectively is when Jesus comes into your heart. He lives within you. And he helps you. Your constant companion. Heads bowed and eyes closed. You want to do that, just raise up your hand. I'm praying with you. Where are you? God bless you. Thank you very much. Outside, you can do that too. The Lord can see you there. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you at this time. I bring these uh, boys and girls, young men actually, and young women, I bring them before you. And I say, oh Lord, receive them in Jesus' name. Forgive their sins. Let your grace come into them so that, Lord, now, the power, the strength to say no to evil and yes to what is right or act right. Give unto them in Jesus' name. I believe you have forgiven their sins. You have saved them. You have changed their lives. They will never be the same again. Thank you, Lord, because I know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. The rest of us, everybody now, wouldn't it be a glorious thing, a wonderful thing if we can come to a unity of decision? And we say we are going to lead the way on our campus to say no to evil, to say yes to righteousness. We are going to lead our campuses to recognize, to respect, to honor constituted authority. Can we do that? Yes. Let's raise up our hands then. You are unity with me, we are unity together. Anywhere we are, in whatever situation, we say no to evil. We say yes to righteousness. And you will be a shining light where you are. The grace of God is sufficient for you. You are now special in the sight of God. And he will give you special strength to do that. You are a young man, you are a lady. Never mind. God will use you. We've heard of people in history. And God used them. Even when they were young, God will use you. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, Amen. I thank you for the fellowship we're about to gather with your children here. And with your children on all these other campuses where we have been connected. Now, we bind ourselves together. A fellowship of righteousness. In a covenant of truthfulness. And Lord, we submit to your authority, the divine authority. And then here on earth, on our campuses, in our communities, in our families too, we submit to delegated authority. We'll respect our leaders. 
will honor our leaders will obey our leaders we will not resist our leaders and lord together with our leaders will become partners in progress help us lord let your grace be abundant in our lives and I pray for anyone having any problem or sickness of infirmity or of constant failure, incessant uh, defeat and downfall. I pray, lift them up in Jesus' name. Put victory in their lives, health in their body, and provide for all their needs. Put joy in their lives. What you have done for them today and this week, nobody will be able to take it away. Let your blessings continue with them. Make them shining lights everywhere they go. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. God bless every one of you.